I am still receiving complaints about the resources I've been giving during the COVID-19 pandemic. I am not fear-mongering, and I'm sorry that you feel that way, but I am happy you're healthy. Skip ahead the next 30 or 40 seconds if it bothers you. I've heard from so many of you thanking me for resources, and I so appreciate your support. So here they are again. There is a crisis text line set up for those suffering from anxiety or depression. Text 741741 for help. If you're experiencing suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK or 8255. If you're suffering from domestic violence, please call 1-800-799-SAFE or 7233 or just dial 911 and leave the line open. Remember, you're not alone. I'll have international resources as well as these U.S. numbers in today's show notes. Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. We have all probably dreamed about winning the lottery. Some of us are dreaming of fancy cars, mansions, and yachts. Some of us just want to get out of poverty and make our lives better. I know that when I used to think of winning the lottery, the first thing I would do is pay off my mom's house and set up an account for her so she wouldn't have to work and struggle. Of course, I still dreamed of a mansion on the beach with my own yacht docked nearby. I am human, like anyone else. But for me, getting a windfall like that, I would want to help everyone that I love, make charitable donations, maybe set up my own foundation for causes I'm passionate about. I didn't grow up with money, and I wouldn't want it to change me. I would want to help others while still enjoying my good fortune. And I still believe it's possible to do both. And yet we've all heard the lotto horror stories. People win millions, only to be destitute within a couple of years. Bad investments, spending sprees, gambling, greedy friends, and drug addiction are depressingly common in lottery winner stories. Bankruptcy, divorce, suicide, and even murder haunt these stories. A man in Florida named Abraham Shakespeare struck lotto gold in 2006. And he had a good heart. He was so generous but his heart of gold would cost him his life. Welcome to episode 97, Abraham Shakespeare, Heart of Gold. Abraham Lee Shakespeare was born on April 24, 1966 in Sebring, Florida, but he grew up in Lake Wells and Lakeland, Florida. Both of those towns are in Polk County, which is located in the central region of Florida. As the name suggests, the towns are dominated by lakes, both naturally occurring and those formed from empty phosphate mines being eventually filled with water. I spoke a little about this in episode 94, about the murder of Peggy Carr. The area is not just dominated by lakes, but also by orange groves. Peggy and the man who poisoned her lived in the middle of one. The demographics of the area in these small cities show a gap. Black people account for 15 to 27 percent of citizens, while white citizens being around 65 to 75 percent of the population, which means other minorities, specifically Hispanic and Latinx, make up the rest. And it was typically the minorities who worked in the citrus fields. Back in Abraham's day and still today with migrant and immigrant workers, being the dominant workforce. Even after slavery was abolished, minorities have long been exploited as cheap labor for agricultural work, and often at a very young age. Abraham was the youngest of four children, and he quit school after the seventh grade and went to work with his father in the citrus fields. He grew up poor, so this may have been to help out his family, but Abraham was also illiterate. By the seventh grade, he should have had the most basic of reading and writing skills, but he didn't. One friend would later describe him as slow-talking and simple-minded. We don't use descriptors like that now, but it's likely Abraham had a learning disability. 
he may have become frustrated by school and chose to work instead. In the 1970s, our education system isn't what it is today, and children like Abraham definitely got left behind. It's not surprising a poor black kid with a learning disability would feel disenfranchised with school and would rather work with his dad. And Abraham also got in trouble at age 13 when he was convicted of theft. He was sent to a reform school where he remained until he was 18 years old. And when he got out, he moved in with his father and stayed out of trouble. But five years in a reform school did not improve his education. Reform school was basically juvenile detention. It wasn't really focused on education. Abraham was what we would probably call functionally illiterate. He became a hard worker and took a lot of menial jobs like washing dishes and even worked sanitation for the city, but also a lot of backbreaking jobs. And he had to juggle many different jobs, finding work where he could because due to his illiteracy, he couldn't even get a driver's license. He couldn't take the written exam. Abraham was a striking, handsome man with long dreadlocks, standing six feet, five inches tall, and weighing 190 pounds. He was lean for that height and muscular from his hard work. When he won the lottery, he was working as a truck driver's assistant for a food distribution company called MBM Corp. He rode with truck drivers on their routes and then helped unload the truck. In 2001, Abraham had a son named Moses with a woman named Antoinette Andrews. Antoinette and Abraham had known each other as kids, and they dated for two and a half years as adults before their breakup. Abraham was close to his son Moses and saw him three to four times a week. Ironically, years later, Antoinette won a $1 million lottery in June 2017. Abraham lived with his father, James, until he died in 2005, and then he moved in with his mother, Elizabeth. And though he was very involved in his son's life, he struggled to make child support payments to Antoinette. Not being able to drive, he was mostly a poorly paid day laborer. In October of 2006, Abraham was arrested for not paying child support to Antoinette. At the time of the arrest, he owed over $8,000 in back child support. After spending three days in jail, Abraham paid $200 towards his past due amount and was released. But when he won the lottery, the first thing he did was catch up his child support payments. Before he won the lotto, his life was pretty quiet. He liked to play pool, and he loved to walk around his favorite lake, Lake Hollingsworth, and hang out with his friends at a supermarket. He was an easygoing, nice guy. He had his money issues, but he wasn't afraid of hard work, and he was a good father despite struggling with child support. On November 15, 2006, Abraham was riding along with co-worker Michael Ford to Miami, Florida, when they stopped at the Town Star convenience store in Frostproof. Abraham asked Michael to pick him up two quick-pick lottery tickets while he was inside. One of those tickets had the winning numbers. 6, 12, 13, 34, 42, and 52. The lottery was up to $31 million by then, and Abraham won. He opted for the $16.9 million lump sum payment. After taxes, he took home $12.7 million. When interviewed, he told one reporter, I don't have to struggle no more. He had no idea A different struggle was just beginning. I'm going to pause now for a short commercial break. As I said, the first thing Abraham did with his winnings was get caught up on his child support payments. He also set up a $1 million trust fund for his son Moses. Next, he gave various family members and friends over $1.75 million. He paid off a $185,000 mortgage for a friend, a $53,000 mortgage for a neighbor, and a $60,000 mortgage for a man whose last name he didn't even know. Abraham even paid for random people's funerals. 
and he didn't just give gifts. He also loaned a lot of people a lot of money. Most of the loans went into buying homes for people, and he had several mortgages in his name. The people he helped would then, in theory, pay him the mortgage payment every month. Sadly, it didn't take long before he was bombarded by people in his community asking him for money, and he soon became overwhelmed and unhappy. In January of 2007, the Sarasota Herald Tribune wrote an article about Abraham. He said he didn't have time to enjoy his money because people were hounding him for money. I haven't been happy, I've been miserable, he told the paper. According to the signal, Abraham told his childhood friend Samuel Jones, I thought all these people were my friends, but then I realized all they want is just money. He even told his brother, I'd have been better off broke. Abraham started Shakespeare and Associates LLC in January 2007 with a lawyer named Cedric E. Lewis. The LLC was created so Cedric could help Abraham organize his money and assets. But when Abraham didn't take Cedric's financial advice, the LLC was dissolved in September of 2008. In January 2007, Abraham bought a house in a gated community on Red Hawk Bend Drive in Lakeland for a little over a million dollars. It was almost 5,000 square feet, had an enclosed pool with two two two-car garages, four bedrooms, three full baths, and two half baths. In March of 2007, he bought a 2007 BMW for $100,000. In July, he bought a 2007 Ford 500, which cost around $30,000. Despite his generosity with family, friends, and even strangers, he was fairly modest with what he bought for himself. He bought a nice spacious home, not really a mansion, and a couple of cool cars. Relatively speaking, he was not ostentatious with his money. In April of 2007, Michael Ford, the truck driver Abraham was riding with the day he bought the lottery tickets, sued Abraham. In the lawsuit, Michael said he bought the two lottery tickets for himself. He claimed that after purchasing the tickets, he put them in his wallet, then placed the wallet in one of the truck's compartments. He accused Abraham of stealing the tickets from his wallet and falsely claiming the prize money. In court, Abraham testified that he asked Michael to buy him the two tickets, and then he paid him back as soon as Michael got back in the truck. The tickets never belonged to Michael. Five co-workers testified that Michael specifically told them he bought the tickets for Abraham and that Abraham did indeed pay him back. It's obvious Michael was trying to take advantage of the fact that he drove the truck and purchased the tickets. He would have been the one seen in the store buying the tickets. Luckily, Michael had blabbed the truth to those five co-workers, and the jury ruled in Abraham's favor. In November 2008, Abraham had another son, Jeremiah, with a woman named Centoria Butler. They dated and even lived together for a few years. Centoria gave birth to their son around the same time they split up. By the time Abraham met a woman named Dee Dee Moore in late 2008, he only had $1.5 million in cash and $3 million in assets left from his fortune. After the disheartening court battle with his ex-co-worker and being hounded by the community trying to take advantage of him, he was ripe to fall victim to someone like Dee. In the fall of 2008, Dee Dee Moore was attending a small business conference in Kissimmee. Abraham's realtor, Barbara Jackson, was also in attendance. Dee approached Barbara and said she was a writer and was interested in writing a book about Abraham's life. Barbara told Dee Dee that she would set up a meeting for the three of them within a few weeks. But she didn't exactly check Dee Dee's resume. She had no training or experience in writing. Barbara later told Tampa Bay Times that when she met Dee Dee Moore, she was in a wheelchair, and Dee told Barbara she had recently been in a car accident. D had been in a car accident, but it was three years before this meeting. In 2005, two people in a Pontiac Sunfire crossed into D's lane of traffic and collided with her Hummer. 
the two people in the Sunfire passed away, while Dee only suffered non-life-threatening injuries. On October 3, 2008, Barbara, Abraham, and Dee Dee met for dinner. When Dee got out of the car, just a few weeks after meeting Barbara, she was no longer in a wheelchair. In fact, she was wearing high heels. Dee blithely told Barbara that she'd been healed through scuba therapy. Dee Dee was born Doris Emma Donegan, and she was about six years younger than Abraham. She grew up poor in Riverview in Plant City, Florida. Her mother would later say this was why she wanted a luxurious lifestyle as an adult. She's been described as a flamboyant but charismatic woman. She wasn't that attractive, but she dressed well. After high school, she became a certified nursing assistant and was married to a man named James Moore for 17 years. They had one son together named RJ. When she was still married, 34-year-old Dee Dee started seeing a man named Shar Kransniki, who was 23 years old. She worked as a CNA for a healthcare professional staffing agency, Arcadia Healthcare. After a year working as a CNA, she moved to an office staff position. After seven or eight months, Dee Dee said she wanted to open a branch of Arcadia Healthcare in Plant City. The branch in Plant City opened, but it wasn't long before a senior staff member noticed a spike in spending and that the business was hemorrhaging money. It was found that Dee Dee had embezzled over $60,000. Arcadia turned Dee Dee into the police, but before she was investigated, the Plant City branch suspiciously caught fire. Oddly, only files were burned in the fire. The office equipment had been moved to a different location right before the fire. But the fire marshal was unable to charge Dee with arson. He couldn't prove it. So Arcadia and Dee Dee Moore reached an agreement. Dee would pay them $25,000 and all investigations and charges would be dropped. When it came time for Dee Dee to pay Arcadia, she blackmailed them instead. According to a former Arcadia employee, Dee told Arcadia she would go to the press and tell them they were knowingly employing people with AIDS. This wasn't true, but not wanting to fight the bad press, Arcadia cut their losses and moved on. In August of 2001, Dee Dee was arrested for insurance fraud and filing a false police report. She had owed $46,000 on a Lincoln Navigator and the bank was threatening to repossess it after she missed payments. So she had a friend drive her Lincoln Navigator and park it in a Pasco County storage garage. Then she had another friend drive her to a town called Womoma in his own vehicle. Before getting in his vehicle, Dee Dee taped her wrists together. As the friend drove, she picked out a ditch, told the driver to slow down, and then threw herself from his vehicle into the ditch. Later, a passerby saw Dee Dee in the ditch and stopped to help. She told the passerby she'd been raped at gunpoint by three Hispanic men who also stole her car. The passerby took her to the police, and the police began to investigate the crime. A few days later, a man saw Dee Dee's story on the news. He called police and said he thought the navigator was in the Pasco County storage garage. Police investigated the claim and found the SUV there. They unraveled Dee Dee's story and even talked to the two people who had helped her with the crime. Dee Dee was convicted and sentenced to one year of probation. And she also once worked for a cell phone business called American Wireless. According to an American Wireless employee, Dee Dee stole over $100,000 from that company. In 2004, she started a medical nursing staffing company called American Medical Professionals. It seems to be her first legitimate business venture. She was still running the company when she met Abraham Shakespeare in 2008. Abraham was no match for a smart grifter like Dee Dee Moore. You can only imagine, being illiterate, he believed her bullshit and signed whatever she put in front of him. As I said, she was charismatic and had a gift for lying. Instead of asking Abraham for money, she manipulated him into signing things that she said were in his best interest. 
She acted as if she was his friend and business partner, not someone else coming to him with her hand out. Within four months of meeting Abraham, Dee Dee had control of all of his money and assets. The financial details of her scams are dizzying, so I will try to condense it in a way we can both understand. In December of 2008, Abraham cashed in a life insurance or annuity account he had bought into worth about $250,000, and he transferred the cash into the business account for Dee Dee's company, American Medical Professionals. Supposedly, she convinced Abraham to do this so that she could pay taxes on his behalf. But she did not pay his taxes. She basically used the account as her personal checking account and funneled much of the money to her boyfriend, Shar. Between January and April of 2009, Dee Dee Moore conned Abraham into signing over all of his properties and assets. On January 9th, he signed over his house on Red Hawk Bend to her company. She would later claim she paid Abraham $655,000 in cash for the house, the home that Abraham had paid over a million dollars for. Two days later, Abraham signed a quick claim deed on two other personal properties he owned over to Dee Dee's company, American Medical Professionals. And then on January 15th, Abraham sold all the mortgages held in his name to American Medical Professionals for $185,000, the loans he had given to friends. And these five mortgages were worth $384,000. Abraham didn't even recover half of what he had loaned. An attorney named Howard Stitzel drew up the documents in an assets purchase agreement. All of those mortgages, plus Abraham's other property and assets, were worth $3.5 million. And yet the deal for Abraham was for less than five cents on the dollar. A couple of weeks later, Dee Dee bought a 2009 Lincoln MKS and titled it in the name of Abraham Shakespeare LLC. On the same day, she traded the new Lincoln to Abraham for his prized BMW. Then she titled the BMW in Char's name. Char, her younger boyfriend, profited quite a bit from Dee Dee's schemes, and she would finally formally divorce her husband James a few weeks later in February of 2009. On February 5th, Abraham's bank, which held the rest of his cash, just a little over $1 million, received a fax supposedly from Abraham, requesting that the account be closed with a check made payable to Abraham Shakespeare for the balance and then mailed to his home address. Just four days later, Dee Dee registered Abraham Shakespeare LLC. She listed herself as the agent and director. Then she opened a new bank account at Bank of America in the name of the LLC, not Abraham personally. She was the only signer on the account, and she started with $100 in cash. When she got the check for over a million dollars from Abraham's old bank, she immediately deposited it into the LLC account she had opened. The bank was provided with the LLC's meeting minutes, attended by Dee Dee, Judith Haggins, who was Abraham's driver and personal assistant, and supposedly Abraham himself. The minutes show that Abraham should be added as an authorized signer on the account. After that, there was no activity on the account until more of the LLC's meeting minutes were sent to the bank a week later. These minutes detailed a discovery of criminal activity from Abraham that might result in criminal charges. Dee Dee, as agent and director of the LLC, told the bank to remove Abraham as an authorized signer on the account. So within two weeks, she had moved his money into an LLC, opened a new account, and then had him removed from the account. It was worth $1,095,000, and Abraham could not touch it. It was incredible. It's painfully obvious that Abraham, who could not even read simple words, had been manipulated into all of this. The day after Abraham was removed from the new bank account, a cashier's check for $250,000 was made payable to a business owned by Shar, Dee Dee's boyfriend. Shar then deposited the check into a credit union account in his name. That same day, 
another cashier's check for $250,000 was made payable to the IRS, but it was endorsed by Dee Dee with instructions on the back that said, quote, not needed for intended purposes, and then she promptly deposited it into her company's account. Some $450,000 worth of cashier's checks were made payable directly to American Medical Professionals, her company, over the next couple of weeks. Dee Dee also bought a Corvette for almost $71,000 with a check from her company and then gifted the car to Char. Also in February of 2009, it appears that Dee Dee paid off Judith Haggins, Abraham's supposed personal assistant and driver, and attorney Howard Stitzel. Each received around $20,000 from the Abraham Shakespeare LLC account, supposedly for services provided. By the end of February, the Bank of America balance was just $44,296. Within a month, Dee Dee had embezzled more than $1 million from the LLC. To celebrate, in March, she bought herself a $90,000 brand new Hummer. In April, Dee Dee bought a house on Highway 60 in Lake Wells for almost $253,000. The title was in Shar's name, but it was paid for with a check from Dee Dee's company. Dee Dee's attorney, and supposedly Abraham's attorney, Howard Stitzel, moved his law office to this house. And then Dee Dee leased the place next door and set up her own office. By April of 2009, no one who knew Abraham personally had seen him. They had received text messages from him, which was strange, because he could not read or write. But considering everything he had been through with so many people hounding him for money, they gave him his space. He was not reported as missing to the police for another seven months. I'm going to pause here for a word from today's sponsor. In early April 2009, Dee Dee called Centoria Butler, the mother of Abraham's second child, and told her Abraham left his Ford 500 for Centoria at Dee Dee's house. Dee even picked Centoria up and took her to go get the car. It looked like she might have been stalling Jeremiah's mother over child support payments. Because in mid-May, Judy Haggins took the Ford 500 back using her power of attorney rights she had in the LLC and then turned it over to Dee Dee. In June, Dee sold the Ford 500 for $9,000. On August 11, 2009, Howard Stitzel went to Polk County Court on behalf of Abraham for a child support enforcement action for his second child. Abraham had fallen behind on payments to Centoria Butler. Stitzel told the judge that Abraham was, quote, out of the country receiving treatment. It was believed that Dee Dee was manipulating Abraham into not paying Centoria. She was feeding him lies about her, convincing him that she was only after his money. Of course, by August, he more than likely had fallen behind on child support payments because he was already dead. On November 3, 2009, Dee Dee sold the BMW for $37,000. She tried to sell the Hummer back to the dealership the next month, saying she needed some quick cash, but they weren't interested, so she wound up selling it to a man for about half of what she paid. She was probably frantically trying to get cash because on November 9, 2009, Abraham Shakespeare was officially reported missing to the police. Abraham's cousin, Cedric Edom, went to the police and said that he and others hadn't seen Abraham since April of 2009. Cedric said that all contact from Abraham was through text, which was weird because they knew Abraham was illiterate. And the only person to have in-person contact with Abraham was Dee Dee Moore. Cedric told police that Dee Dee had purchased all of Abraham's assets and moved into his house in April of 2009. Cedric also admitted to police that Dee Dee had paid him $5,000 to deliver a birthday card to Abraham's mom that was supposedly signed by Abraham. Police immediately began investigating Abraham's disappearance. Throughout the investigation, 
Police met with many people who knew Abraham, including his family, ex-girlfriends, and friends. Almost every person said the last time they saw Abraham was in April of 2009. Police also received many tips stating where Abraham was, but they were always found to be untrue. In fact, most of the tips came from people Dee Dee had paid to call and report a false tip. During that first week when Abraham was reported missing, police had multiple interviews with Dee Dee. She wasn't under arrest, but she was always too helpful. She would even call them to help with the investigation, giving details they had never asked her about. Her stories were always inconsistent and added confusion to the case. She told police she met Abraham in October of 2008 because she wanted to write a book about his life. After meeting Abraham, Dee Dee realized how many people were taking advantage of him. So she offered her assistance with his financial affairs out of, quote, the goodness of her heart and not for any financial gain. She claimed that because Abraham was so upset about being taken advantage of and the constant harassment from the community, he made a plan to leave the Lakeland area and never be heard from again. She told police that Abraham sold his Red Hawk Bend Drive residence to her for 655000 She also told them she had bought all of the debt owed to him for a total of 185000 She told police she paid him 500000 in cash, but couldn't provide any proof of payment. She then changed her story a couple of times. First, she said she didn't pay him because he had a drug problem and she was afraid he would go on a bender. Then she said she never paid him because he didn't want to pay a gift tax, which makes no sense because he sold her the assets, the payment would not be a gift. But Dee Dee just kept on talking. She said that in February of 2009, she set up Abraham Shakespeare LLC for the sole purpose of keeping track of the money collected on the debts she had purchased from Abraham. She also told the police that she was a millionaire anyway before meeting Abraham and didn't need his money. That was an outright lie. Between March 9th, 2005, and January 7, 2009, American medical professionals had profits just under 720000 Not too shabby, but she definitely was no millionaire. That was less than $200,000 a year, and she spent money like it was water. Police then subpoenaed financial records for Abraham, Dee Dee, and her boyfriend, Shar. They quickly found that Dee was lying. They knew that by April of 2009, she was in complete control of all of Abraham's assets and accounts, and she hadn't paid him any of the money she owed him. The police theorized Abraham started to question when she was going to pay him, and that's when things went wrong. Police also met with a notary named Ambrose Austin. Austin told police Abraham signed a document designating Judy Haggins as his power of attorney on April 3rd, 2009. Both Judy and Abraham were present at the signing. In the same week, police heard from Centoria Butler, the mother of Abraham's second child. Centoria told police that Dee had just come to see her and offered her a car and a house if she went to police and told them that she'd seen Abraham recently. Police also met with Howard Stitzel at his law office that first week. Stitzel said he couldn't detail their conversation due to client-attorney privilege, but he had talked with Abraham on October 6, 2009, on the phone. He claimed he knew it was Abraham by his voice. A day later, police met with Judy Haggins. She said the last time she saw Abraham alive was at the notary signing in April. She said she used the power of attorney to close bank accounts and sign court pleadings on his behalf. She also said the proceeds of closed accounts had been deposited into accounts controlled by Dee Dee. She told police the checks written in her name totaling 20000 were cashed and given to Abraham, just like Dee Dee told her to do. Before the interview was over, Haggins told the police that Abraham was illiterate and could not be texting on his own. It's debatable whether Judy actually gave Abraham any cash because she seems very complicit with Dee. 
but at least she told the truth about when she had last seen him and pointed out that he could not text. Police met with Dee Dee again on November 25th. In this meeting, she admitted she sent texts as Abraham in the summer of 2009 to Abraham's friends and family in an attempt to convince him that he was still alive. I'm guessing they didn't arrest her right away because they needed to find Abraham's body and more evidence. Instead, they interviewed her again on December 3rd. This time she changed her story and said Abraham left his cell phone with her so police couldn't track it, and he asked her to text people with the phone. Police asked her if she had the cell phone on October 6th, the day Stitzel claimed he spoke with Abraham, and she said yes. She said Abraham did not talk to her or Stitzel that day, and she admitted she told Howard Stitzel to lie to law enforcement. Next, the police asked her about the money transfers to her company, American Medical Professionals. She said that she and Abraham transferred the money because he was avoiding paying child support. When asked why Howard Stitzel received $20,000, Dee said the money was payment for his legal services. Police met with Judy Haggins again around December 11th. This time she admitted that in March of 2009, Abraham came to her and said he had concerns about Dee and his money. And not long after that, Dee Dee came to her and told her not to let Abraham go to the bank because some of the money was not there. Evidently, she went along with this. Ridiculously, on December 27th, Dee Dee had someone pose as Abraham and call his mother. Abraham's mother was conveniently at dinner with Dee when she got the call. She knew it wasn't Abraham on the phone. She knew her son's voice. But she played along and stayed on the call for around eight minutes. After dinner, she called the police and told them about the call. Police traced the number back to an old friend of Abraham's named Greg Smith. Before he won the lottery, Abraham used to do small jobs around Greg's barbershop for money. After he won, Greg borrowed $63,000 from Abraham to buy his mother's home. Obviously, Dee knew Greg since she had bought all of the mortgages. Police found Greg on December 28th having lunch with Dee Dee. They waited until the meal was over and she left before approaching him. He admitted that Dee had paid him to make several calls for her, including an anonymous tip to the police claiming he had seen Abraham in Miami. He was also the guy who had called Abraham's mom for several hundred dollars. But Greg claimed he was only helping Dee because she had threatened to foreclose on the house since she owned the mortgage. Like so many of Abraham's so-called friends, he hadn't kept up his payments. He generously told police he would be glad to help them because he thought Abraham was a good man and deserved to have someone help him. Greg met with Dee Dee multiple times wearing a wire. During these meetings, Dee asked him to do all kinds of things to make it look as though Abraham was still alive including delivering a letter to Abraham's mother on January 6th. The typed letter stated that Abraham was fine and was staying away from Lakeland because the police wanted to arrest him. The letter even referenced the December 27th phone call and asked how his own mother couldn't recognize her son's voice. Greg said that while typing the letter, Dee Dee wore gloves, a cap covering her hair, shoe covers, and a surgical mask. She didn't want any DNA on the letter. After a few weeks of asking Greg to do random acts for her, Dee asked him if he knew anyone willing to tell law enforcement that they had killed Abraham. Greg said he'd think about it and let her know. After discussing it with police, they decided that Greg would introduce an undercover officer posing as a man willing to take the rap to Dee Dee. The officer, Mike Smith, would tell Dee he was facing a long prison term anyway and was willing to admit to killing Abraham in exchange for $50,000. On January 21st, 2010, Mike Smith, posing as Greg's cousin, met with Dee Dee. She said she'd pay him 50 grand if he would tell the police he killed Abraham. Mike Smith said he would, but he needed to know where the body was in order to make the story believable. 
She said she'd tell him the location of the body and give him the gun used to kill Abraham. Next, a plan between Dee Dee, Mike Smith, and Greg Smith came together. Mike Smith would dig up the body and move it to a different location. That way, he could tell the police where it was located. Then Dee Dee would give him the gun to, quote, solidify the confession. On January 25th, the plan didn't go exactly the way they discussed. Instead, Dee Dee met with Greg Smith and gave him the 38 caliber Smith & Wesson. Two hours later, Greg and Dee got in her vehicle and drove to the house she bought on Highway 60, the house that attorney Howard Stitzel used for his office. Dee Dee showed Greg a 30 by 30 foot concrete slab that was poured on April 13th, 2009 in a wooded area about 30 yards north of the residence. She said Abraham was buried beneath the slab, then used a piece of iron to show where his remains were, six feet below. Next, Dee showed Greg a white Ford truck with a trailer she had previously parked near the slab. She told Greg to look in the trailer, and inside he found gallons of fuel and bleach, gloves, and a metal tub. She told Greg that after digging up Abraham, he could put the body in the metal tub to transport him. She said Abraham was killed in her office while sitting in a round chair. He had to be dragged out of the office and into another room. Remember, her office was in the house next door. Then she gave him the keys to the truck and left. Greg met with police and told them what happened. He also gave them the gun. Police told Greg to call Dee and tell her police had surrounded the area of where the body was buried. He was supposed to ask her if she had set him up. Later that evening, on January 25th, police talked to Dee Dee again. This time, she said Abraham came to her office with drug dealers in an attempt to get $200,000 in cash. She said the dealer shot Abraham with her 38 caliber, which was in an open gun safe in her office. When the police didn't buy that story, she even hinted that her 14-year-old son, RJ, shot Abraham. Good Lord, this woman is such a piece of shit. Although she would not admit to killing Abraham, she did admit to buying the lime that she poured over Abraham's body. Before the interview ended, Dee Dee asked if she could keep all of her things if she told the truth as to who actually killed Abraham. It's like she really believed she could con her way out of this and keep all of her fancy crap. The next morning, police searched the property. Forensics found blood on the carpet between the round chair and the desk in the office and on the carpet in front of the door opening to the kitchen in Dee's house. On the same day, police met with Stitzel at his attorney's office. He said the last time he physically saw Abraham was sometime between April or May 2009 at his prior office location. And he admitted the phone call on October 6, 2009, when he supposedly spoke with Abraham, happened in Dee's presence. Police also met with Dee Dee's boyfriend, Shar, that day. He took a polygraph and was cleared as a suspect. He had no idea what had happened. He said that Dee Dee told him she got all of her money from whistleblowing tax evaders to the IRS. She had told her parents the same story. The next day, police met with Judith Haggins at her lawyer's office. She said Abraham asked for her to be his power of attorney, and it was notarized and filed on April 3, 2009. She said Dee would, quote, embellish how serious Abraham's child support proceedings were and would encourage him to move money within his various accounts in an attempt to protect it from the biological mother of his child. Judith claimed she told Abraham his child support case was not as serious as Dee had told him. In 2009, she was told by Dee to withdraw the remaining funds from some of Abraham's accounts, which was less than $2,000 total. The money, in cashier's checks, was then given to Dee Dee. She drained every last penny. On January 28th, police met with Dee's ex-husband, James Moore. James said Dee Dee asked him to recommend what type of equipment she should use to clear her land on Highway 60. He suggested a tractor, but she bought a backhoe on April 3rd, 2009. Dee Dee asked John to use the backhoe to dig a hole for concrete and trash in the first two weeks of April. 
She asked for the hole to be dug behind the rear door of the house she leased for office space, but he said it was too close to the house. So she suggested a location behind the house she owned, the house Howard Stitzel used for office space. James dug the hole and then left. Dee called around two hours later and asked him to come fill the hole. It was getting dark, and he didn't see a body in there. He thought it was chunks of concrete. After talking to James Moore, police met with RJ, his son, the next day. He said his mom came home almost exactly a year earlier, on January 25, 2009, and said that she, Abraham, Cedric, and another drug dealer were at her house when Abraham, quote, choked her out, then Cedric or the drug dealer grabbed her gun and shot him. Prior to this story, Dee Dee said she didn't know where Abraham was, but that Cedric was telling people she had killed him. RJ said he did not shoot Abraham, and he had never seen him choke Dee Dee. The same day police met with RJ, they interviewed Dee again. This time, she admitted to asking James to dig the hole and admitted to burying Abraham's body in the hole. She said that James did not know a body was in the hole. She also admitted she owned the 38 caliber she gave to Greg, but she would not admit that she killed Abraham. Instead, she gave story after story when police didn't believe her. Abraham's cousin Cedric killed him. Her son RJ killed him. Maybe she killed him in self-defense and didn't remember it. Drug dealers came to her office with Abraham, then took her gun from her open safe and shot him. Or, in her most creative tale, her attorney, Howard Stitzel, came to her office with two white drug dealers when an argument ensued. Abraham tried to shoot Stitzel, but the gun jammed. Stitzel grabbed the 32 from the safe and shot Abraham in the chest. Stitzel and one dealer left. The second dealer told her to dig a hole and then he would take care of the body. On and on she lied. She behaved so inappropriately in police interviews that she even made sexual advances to one of the detectives. On January 30th, police met with Dee Dee for the last time. This time, she repeated the Stitzel drug dealer story. When police didn't believe this story, she said, well, maybe Greg Smith did it. When they told her Greg Smith worked for them, she said, okay, maybe Mike Smith did it. Police then informed Dee that Mike Smith was an undercover agent. A shocked Dee Dee Moore then said she wanted an attorney. Dee Dee had many stories to explain where Abraham was between April 2009 and January 28, 2010. She claimed he was in Jamaica, receiving medical treatment for AIDS, that he had moved away to avoid the pressures associated with having all the money, that he was in Texas, that he was on a beach somewhere, and on and on and on. Dee Dee played her final card when she revealed a videotape. She had filmed Abraham in early April 2009. In the video, she asked Abraham if he was tired of people asking for money. When he said yes, she asked if he wanted to go somewhere else like California or a foreign country. Then she asked if he would miss home, and he said yes, but life goes on. This was Dee Dee's proof that Abraham had moved away and wasn't dead but Abraham's remains had been found two days earlier at the house on Highway 60, around six feet below the 30 by 30 foot concrete slab, the house Howard Stitzel had used for office space. Meaning the first time they spoke with Howard in November, Abraham's body was buried about 30 yards from where they spoke. The USF Anthropology Department helped the police department excavate the grave by using ground-penetrating radar, moving it over the slab, looking for abnormalities underground that would be indicative of a burial site. It took two days of breaking the concrete with an excavator and removing pieces until they could get close to the body. There was about three to six inches of lime covering his body. His fingerprints and palm prints were embedded in the hardened lime. Rather than destroying evidence as Dee Dee had hoped, the lime preserved Abraham's fingerprints, and the police were able to positively identify him quickly. Abraham's autopsy was performed on January 29, 2010. 
The autopsy described Abraham as, quote, a partially mummified, decomposing, and focally skeletonized man. The ME found that Abraham had been shot twice in the chest. Two 32 caliber bullets were found in his body. The official cause of death was homicidal violence. Abraham Shakespeare's funeral was held on February 6, 2010, and he was laid to rest in Oak Hill Burial Park in Lakeland. His tombstone lists his date of death as April 7, 2009, the last day after any legitimate phone calls were made from his cell phone. In the probable cause affidavit, police stated that in every story, Dee Dee admitted to being present when Abraham was shot, and that there was no credible evidence linking anyone other than Dee Dee to the homicide. Dee Dee Moore was charged with accessory after the fact on February 2nd, before finally being charged with first degree murder on February 19th. She told reporters, I'm not scared. I'm not scared of going to jail for murder because there's no jury that's going to convict me. Dee Dee's trial began on November 28, 2012, in Hillsborough County, Florida. The prosecution presented the case that Dee Dee had preyed upon the frustrations and fears of Abraham to get her hands on his dwindling fortune. And then she had gone to great lengths to cover up his murder. They laid out the timeline of events police uncovered during their investigation. The prosecution theorized that Abraham found out about Dee Dee taking all of his money and went to confront her at her office when he threatened her, either by saying he would turn her into the police or possibly with bodily harm. Then Dee Dee shot him. The defense presented the case that a lot of people owed money to Abraham. Any one of those people could have killed him. That Dee Dee wasn't a killer. She was just a good friend who helped Abraham with his finances. The defense said police focused on Dee Dee and didn't follow any other leads, which wasn't true. The police interviewed many people, including Michael Ford, the ex co worker who had sued Abraham over the winning lottery ticket. But they had cleared him, and all other evidence pointed to Dee Dee. Dee's behavior during the trial was outrageous. She got in trouble multiple times for outbursts and smiling and nodding at the jury. The judge had to ask her attorneys more than once to talk to her about her behavior and get her under control. She was a total drama queen. On December 10th, 2012, the jury deliberated for three hours before they found Dee Dee guilty of first-degree murder. Jurors spoke to the press and admitted that three had originally wanted to convict her of second-degree murder, thinking Abraham might have been killed in a struggle for the gun. But the other jurors pointed out how close the bullet holes were. It didn't look like a struggle. It looked deliberate. They also thought the video she took of Abraham talking about possibly moving showed premeditation. She was trying to cover up the murder before she had even committed it. She was sentenced on December 10, 2012 to life without parole for the murder and 25 years for using a gun in the commission of a felony. During sentencing, the judge told Dee Dee she was, quote, probably the most manipulative person that this court has seen. The only reason the state did not seek the death penalty was because it was against Abraham's mother's wishes. Dee Dee Moore is currently imprisoned in Lowell Correctional Institution in Ocala, Florida. In 2013, Abraham's assets were finally returned to his family. Dee Dee's younger boyfriend, Shar, moved to Atlanta and married in 2012. Howard Stitzel still practices law in Florida in the Tampa area. Judith Haggins appears to be living a quiet life, still in Lakeland. She actually testified against Dee at trial. Greg Smith helped write the book Unlucky Number with Deborah Mathis. I did not use it for research in this case. Abraham Shakespeare has been called simple-minded due to his learning disability. But I think he was a simple man in the pure sense of the word. A good man with a good heart. He didn't need or want luxury. He wanted to be comfortable and to help his friends, family, and community. But the greed of the people he helped hurt him so much, he isolated himself from those he loved, and he fell under the spell of a clever grifter who stole everything from him, 
down to his last penny, and then she took his life. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. Southern Fried's audio is edited by Chaz Gray. Don't forget to subscribe to Fetal Abduction, a true crime podcast. I'm really excited to be working with Haley Gray's team, and by the end of May, you'll have two places to listen to me. And I'd like to remind you to come join my Facebook group. We share memes and have a lot of laughs. It's a lovely community, and we'd love to have you. But remember, no shit ass is allowed. We even have a t-shirt now. Check out my website if you want to get one, southernfriedtruecrime.com. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe, and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and Spotify, as well as Stitcher Premium where you can listen ad-free. If you have any case suggestions, please email southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I'm sorry, but I no longer answer private messages on social media. I manage three platforms, and it's just too overwhelming. But please feel free to reach out by email. Not only do I get my most interesting and little-known cases from listener suggestions, I love hearing from you guys. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Wash your hands, stop touching your face, and y'all take care.